from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Tech. China pushes back with trade tariffs as grain marketers hope for resolution. Ag Tech keeps coming. Helping crops when nature doesn't provide the latest amazing technology on irrigation systems. That story from Milan, Tennessee, coming up on Ag Day. In agribusiness, the price potential of corn. If any possible way to, to don't sell, that would be the right decision. And these Wisconsin roots are getting tangled in the trade war. Ag Day, presented by the Chevy Silverado. High strength steel for high strength dependability. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Chinese officials say the country wants to maintain constructive contact between the U.S. and China, calling it the only correct choice. Those statements coming from the Chinese State Counselor Wang Yi following a meeting with U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo last week. Following those comments, on Friday, China announcing fresh retaliatory tariffs of its own. The nation listing tariffs of $60 billion on U.S. goods ranging from liquefied natural gas, some aircraft, beef, steel products, and coffee. China warning that further measures may be taken, signaling it won't back down from a trade war with Washington. The new list of tariffs from China would cover more than 5,000 goods imported from the U.S. and range from 5 to 25 percent. The Chinese Commerce Ministry saying timing will depend on the actions of the United States. Those Chinese tariffs follow the U.S. own threat of a 25 percent duty on $200 billion worth of Chinese goods. Some economic analysts say all of this trade war talk has money sitting on the sidelines. If a deal does get worked out, that could be good news for American agriculture. If we're talking like soybeans, the potential, if this gets resolved at some, so at some point, uh, is seeing a, a price boost, right? Oh, for sure. I mean, you would immediately get over $10 so that guys can at least sell something because they're not going to sell it below 10 Right. And, um, and if, if we go to the seller's price right now, the seller's price right now is $2 higher than where we're trading. That's $11 beans. So it wouldn't be unreasonable to think $11 at all. And I think you'd have all of these investor hedge fund guys coming in knowing this after the market real, real fast. That's why watching the news on this tariffs is so important. Also in China, that country reporting Friday its first outbreak of deadly African swine fever. Authorities there rushing to control the highly contagious disease, calling about a thousand hogs in northeast part of the country. Previously, cases have been recorded across Europe, Russia, and sub-Saharan Africa, but it has never occurred in East Asia until now. A federal jury decided Friday that Smithfield Foods, the world's largest pork producer, should pay $473 million to neighbors of three North Carolina hog operations. The jury found that Smithfield owes compensation to six neighbors who complained in their lawsuit that the company failed to stop odors coming from the farms. While the jury awarded nearly a half billion dollars, damages are automatically reduced to $94 million under limits in state law. While U.S. farmers talk about trade and prices, new numbers show U.S. farmland values just hit a record. According to USDA, average farmland values nationwide increased nearly 2% to $3,100 an acre. The Ag Department says it shows that farmland continues to be used as a longer-term investment. Now the Corn Belt, it remains the nation's most expensive land at $6,400 an acre. I think they'll continue to be soft. Uh, there's just a lot of uncertainty right now, and people don't like uncertainty. If you're an outside investor, some of the luster is kind of lost off of ag right now. Right. Uh, there's just a, a lot of uncertainty, especially around this trade issue. Uh, I think without the trade issue, we would have prices quite a bit higher than they were today. We'd be, it would be a much different tone today, I think. Uh, were this not the case, but it is the case, and so we got to deal with it. State by state, the picture is varied. Missouri saw the largest gain in values, rising 10% to $3,700. The biggest drop, well, that was in Kansas, where values declined nearly 3% to $1,800 an acre. USDA also posting the newest data on cash rents, the national average, $138 per acre. That's up $2 from last year. California leads the nation with a state average cash rent of $340 to the acre. That's up from $325 last year. While in the Corn Belt, Iowa leads the way at $231 to the acre, unchanged from last year. As farmers weigh costs versus profit in 2018, new equipment and new technologies getting a close inspection. Researchers at UT's Institute of Agriculture are doing the same including testing the latest technology in irrigation. As Charles Denny reports, the idea of applying water with precision 
may be the next big innovation. Water, just the right amount at the right time. Stretching hundreds of feet, this pivot irrigation machine pumps moisture and boosts yields, giving soybeans and corn a drink. You know, I think irrigation is going to become increasingly important. Management of water, period, is going to be, a, I think, a major issue going in the future. UT Ag Research Superintendent Blake Brown says these crops are at a critical time, the reproductive stage. This part of West Tennessee has seen more than enough rain, but it doesn't take long for a plush field to turn brown. Uh, you know, they say here in Tennessee we go from a flood to a drought in 10 days, and that's really true. When it's hot like it is now, mid to high 90s, uh, these crops really start stressing early. And the irrigation, yeah, that tends to level out. Uh, we say water covers a lot of eels. The Milan Center is using technology called VRI, or Variable Rate Irrigation. Based on soil types and the lay of the land, here the rate of water application is controlled by changing the speed of the pivot and the position of nozzles around the field. That allows us to divide the, the whole area irrigated up into zones and each zone can get anywhere from zero to 100% of what our application rate is. This giant machine is controlled by computer and a cell phone modem, both to monitor the amount of water being sprayed. And yes, you can turn it on and off with your mobile device. Chris Bridges monitors the system, including sensors transmitting data about moisture levels. He says VRI technology tells what part of a field needs irrigation and other parts that can do without. Absolutely, especially in a research environment, we may have many different crops, many different planting dates uh, under the same pivot. And so having the variable rate irrigation system allows us to manage water more precisely and to water exactly what the crop needs at the time that it's needed. To grow our food, our crops need nourishment, and sometimes mankind has to provide. When it comes to irrigation, the goal is to use the least amount of water possible, but still get the maximum benefit. This is Charles Denny reporting. Let's start your day with a look at farm country weather. David Harker from Magda Affiliate WNDU-TV in South Bend has our weather duties today. David. Good morning, Clinton. We start out in Adams County, Pennsylvania, one of the biggest apple producing counties in that state. A NASCROP reporter says apples are beginning to look slightly less than the average yield. Now, some orchards have a 50% reduction due to poor pollination. Peach harvest has also started, but yields are lower than expected. In the state of Michigan, also a big apple producing state, NAS says apples continue to size well despite the dry summer. Now, the state's blueberry crop on the east side of the state has struggled due to the drought. 70% of the state is at least in some level of dryness or drought. In fact, as we take a look at the drought monitor, you can see it in the state of Michigan, but as well out west. Unfortunately, the wildfires continue to go at this point. I'll let you know if precipitation is in the forecast across the entire United States. We'll talk temperatures as well. That's coming up. But right now, here are some hometown temps. Keeping track of the shifting market prices has never been so easy. Get the latest commodity prices sent directly to your cell phone with market updates. Just text MARKETS8 to 31313 to get started. When we come back, Bill Biederman joins us once again with a look at the corn market and its potential for movement, plus machinery. Pete. You like big red four-wheel drive tractors? Then stick around, folks. I got something just for you. And we're headed in the country to Wisconsin. No, it's not a milk or cheese story, but what about a popular route in China? What's a connection? We'll have some answers. In agribusiness, let's see how markets wrapped up a turbulent week. We head to the floor of the CME in Chicago for those to take. Soybeans, they really started to slide. That new round of tariffs are weighing on the futures and the market right out of the box really started to sink. It actually did come back midday, but overall it's a little bit lower. We're watching very closely. It's kind of making it, uh, it all but impossible to find a solution anytime soon. And with that kind of sentiment, it makes it difficult for anyone to really jump into the market here. Corn was a little bit higher and some areas of the Corn Belt is really showing some drought conditions. And so we have to watch that, even though in Missouri and some areas of the north are expecting some rain coming up. Uh, the wheat was mixed today. Uh, that tariff war just keeps the uh, traders very, very cautious. Cattle jumped up. That strong cash bids to end the week really pushed that market higher. And now, as we see, it got up over $2. 
uh, plus the technical buying uh, really underpinning those futures. The prices rose uh, a more than 1%, and it just seems that the live cattle has actually shrugged off any kind of tariff war talk or any difficulty with that. The feeders were also higher. That confidence in that beef demand strength uh, continues, and that uh, you know had that working strong. That's all from the floor at the CME Group here in Chicago. I'm Virginia McGaffey. We're on the road for analysis today. We've got Bill Biederman, Allendale Incorporated, our guest today. And Bill, as we look at the corn market, um, you know, right now prices haven't been super attractive. No, they are attractive. They're really cheap. They're really if you're cheap. a buyer. I guess if you're a buyer, and I should, yeah, I guess I should say it that way. But, but for a seller. What's the potential out there? Is there potential for the corn market? There's, yeah, I, absolutely. If any possible way to, to don't sell, that would be the right decision. Uh, we've got a huge foundation because we're actually consuming more corn than we're producing. We've been doing that for the last two years. Our ending stocks in the United States has dropped about 20, 25%. And in the world, we've dropped 30%. So, you know, it's, and, and if you look at the stocks to use ratio, we're down to like the lowest levels in only four other years in history in the U.S. and only one other year, 1973, in the world. So if you resolve or have any bullish news, whether it's tariff resolutions or NAFTA, or which we think we'll get, or, or a, a crop problem, the buyers are going to come in for this right now because it's so cheap and it's below cost of production. Yeah, yeah. So, so you think that there's a real price potential for a significant move with corn, uh, and that's something that you'll be watching, you know, through the rest of this year and yeah, the next I, year. I would be shocked if we don't get over four dollars by early next year. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, it is a dynamic market. Obviously, there's a lot of news and and fundamental issues going on out there. So we'll have to see how those those shake out. But good stuff. All right. Appreciate it, Bill. All Thank right. you for being here. We'll yep. be back for more ideas. To talk with Bill Biederman one-on-one, call Allendale Incorporated at 815-404-1917 or head online to allendale-inc.com. Welcome back to Agday. Let's take a look at the jet stream map as we look over the course of this entire week. Notice we've got uh, low on the action down to the south. In fact, uh, areas in the deep south as well as the southeast are likely to deal with more or less dry conditions. And what we're probably going to see is this big ridge of high pressure build into the west. And that's what's unfortunately going to cause more dry conditions for the places that unfortunately don't need it. Another system moving through the New England region as we get to the middle of the work, the middle of the week. And as we transition to Thursday. You notice the dry conditions and hot temperatures continue to perspire all across the United States, especially out west by Friday. So let's talk about what we've got going on with regards to temperatures this week. In fact, most of the United States is above normal on temperatures. The only spot that's below normal sitting in the Ohio River Valley and stretching down through Alabama and Mississippi, as well as the extreme northwestern portion of Georgia and the Carolinas. Now, when we talk precipitation, above normal. Notice the entire eastern seaboard as well up to New England getting rain showers where they don't need them. Now the good news is some of this does make its way down into Texas and Oklahoma. Some of the spots that we've seen a little bit of drought. Unfortunately, the dry conditions in the northern plain states as well as out west. Unfortunately, not getting any relief from Mother Nature with regards to the wildfires out that way. Now, when we start talking 30 day temps, we're likely to be back below normal. Now, this is already talking in the month of September uh, that we see an end to the 30 days. So below normal up in the upper Midwest, as well as the Great Lakes region above normal. The heat continues back down in Texas, Oklahoma, as well as in Kansas. Uh, normal conditions in the Four Corners region back above normal. When we talk the entire West Coast, temperatures continue to to be above normal. Now, when we talk precipitation, unfortunately, it's going to take some time to get the relief out west that we need. Even 30 days out above normal on the rainfall side, Four Corners region where the monsoonal season continues below normal in the upper northwest. And look what happens, as mentioned, along the eastern seaboard, the Ohio River Valley stretching all the way down into the panhandle of Florida. Unfortunately, we're getting that precipitation where it is no longer needed. It's going to take some time to finally dry out and get rid of all the flooding that has has occurred in all of those conditions, whether it be down south in Mississippi, Alabama, or even Georgia, stretching all the way up into upstate Pennsylvania and New York, something that we're going to watch very carefully.
Now let's take a look at some local forecasts. Here's a look at your forecast for Stockton, California. Hazy and hot, remaining dry with 94. A lot of haze because of the wildfires. We make our way up to the thumb of Michigan. Minden City showers likely 84 degrees for a temperature and Waynesboro, Georgia, a high of 91 with some storms. Thanks. All right, stick with us. Machinery Pete is here next with some used equipment prices you won't want to miss. Today he's talking about big four wheel drive tractors and why is a state known for its milk and cheese also the number one producer for a root known for its medicinal purposes. Crop prices may not be where farmers want them, but that's not slowing down used tractor values. Machinery Pete is here to explain. Come on up for sale tomorrow, Tuesday, August 7th, on a farm auction in North Central Iowa is this 2003 Case IH STX375 four-wheel drive tractor. It's got 2,867 hours on it, and it's a bareback. And the sale is by my friends at Ryerson Realty and Auction. Now, with this or any piece of equipment you're looking at buying or trading, uh, the key is to find good recent comparables. And if we, if we did that with STX375s, I'd start by telling you about this one, that sold last Thursday on a farm auction out in West Central Minnesota, real close to where I grew up, sailed by uh, Zilsdorf Auctions. It was a really nice 2005 model SDX 375, 1,829 hours on it with the PTO, brought $95,500. Now that is the highest auction price in 34 months on an STX 375, but it did have that PTO, which is really valuable. Now, if we tried to stay with the bareback comparables, I would uh, throw a couple of them out for you. Here's a picture of the first. This was an STX 375 sold on a consignment auction by Sullivan Auctioneers December 28th of last year, West Central Illinois. And this one had 1,956 hours on it and brought $83,500. Now a couple months before that on a farm auction in Central Ohio, here's a picture of a STX 375 with 2,261 hours on it, also bareback. This was sold by the Went Group, and that brought $83,000. Now remember, folks, at MachineryPete.com, you can search by upcoming auction event or by specific piece of equipment on those upcoming auctions. Information is updated every day. Unless you use herbal medicines, you may not be too familiar with ginseng, but did you know it's an important crop for one Midwestern state? We'll take you there next on In the Country. In the Country, sponsored by the all-new Kubota Sidekick, a utility vehicle that lets you climb more, cover more, tow more, and enjoy more. Visit KubotaUSA.com. Wisconsin is known for its dairy farms and cheese production, but did you also know it leads the country in ginseng production? It produces about a million pounds a year, and it's one of those little-known crops in the U.S. with a huge demand in China. Unfortunately, it's being threatened by a 15% retaliatory tariff assessed by China. In this video provided by the Wisconsin Counties Association, we see why Marathon County is home to so much commercially grown ginseng. Geology, geography, climate, and plant genetics play an important role in ginseng cultivation, and central Wisconsin ginseng is among the best in the world. Marathon County is the leader in American ginseng production. In fact, 95% of U.S. ginseng is exported from Marathon County alone. The, the average person, even, even in Marathon County, probably doesn't even realize how important it is. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a big market, it's a, it's a big cash crop here. Um, and it's not something that we you know, necessarily consume ourselves. And so it's something that's kind of deceptively important to our, to our economy. The city of Wausau hosts an international Wisconsin ginseng festival every year in mid-September. Many of the activities take place right on downtown Wausau's 400 block, but there's a wide variety of tours, demos, and activities throughout the entire area. There is over 100 years of history of growing ginseng in central Wisconsin. This is an area that the soil and the mineral content really helps bring forth some of those unique flavors in ginseng that can't be replicated in other parts of the world. Sioux Ginseng Enterprises, a ginseng farm in rural Wausau, is able to serve customers around the world. The main consumers of ginseng historically and traditionally have been Chinese consumers, but that's quickly changing due to its health benefits. When you talk to Chinese consumers, they know that Wisconsin grows ginseng. And that's what I think I find amazing about this product is that it has such an international appeal, but yet so many people who live in this state don't realize that it's grown in their backyard. 
I've uh, been using it uh, throughout my career, uh, including uh, when I won the French Open in, um, in 1989 as a 17-year-old. So uh, I have a lot of uh, good memories there, and um, you know, Jensen's been playing uh, an important uh, role in my, in my health and in my uh, life ever since. And now you know your Wisconsin. Ginseng also grows wild, but it's illegal to dig it up in a national forest without a permit. That's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in, spend part of your day with us. From all of us here at Ag Dam, Clinton Griffiths, have a great week in farm country.